Morning, um, my name's Daryl Handley. Um, just by a show of hands, uh, who, who's heard of GDHV UK? Who's heard of Dimplex? What would you know Dimplex for? Okay. Sounds about right, yeah. Um, Leck? Fridges? Roberts? Roberts Radio? Carmen? Belling? Stoves? Familiar sort of names, okay. So I'm going to talk a bit or a lot about heat pumps. I'll introduce a little bit about <coughs> who we are and what we do, and we'll try and get to know each other a bit better. GDHV UK is, is what we currently call ourselves Glen Dimplex Heating and Ventilation. It encompasses a very wide group of companies. Glen Dimplex itself was started in 1973. Um, by the Norton family, and the Norton family is still very much part of the business today. It's a privately owned company that funds all of its own investments, so we're fairly safe and secure in, the, in terms of a position in the market with the world's largest manufacturer of electric heating products, electric space heating products. We manufacture around about 800 different products, most of which I should have the opportunity to sell at some point. But it, it's, quite a, it's quite a job to sort of encompass everything. So we have interest in space heating, water heating, cooling, heat pumps, domestic white goods. A whole wide portfolio of product. I say many of the names that you'll, you'll recognise there, Dimplex, Creda. We're in the flame technology market, which is fires, gas fires, electric fires with Dimplex. The business grew from one small factory producing oil-filled radiators to the sort of the global brands that you might see here. Um, the business employs about 10,000 people and turns over about, about 2 billion euros. We're not exactly sure because Mr Norton won't tell us. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a big operation when you bring it together. But the business has grown by attracting and buying brands, buying a good brand, making an investment and trying to improve that, that product and that manufacturing and improve the brand in the market and that's where we are today but about four years ago a new management team was brought in uh, as a supervisory board and all of the business units were set a task to develop a strategy and a way in which we as, as an entire business could double the size of the business and does that mean doubling turnover doubling profit whatever you want it to mean but the premise was was to grow go out and grow the business so we're now in just starting year three of that process and the idea is, is to bring together more of those business units instead of having completely separate companies potentially doing the same thing. So, for example, we could be manufacturing one product in Germany and manufacturing exactly the same product in Ireland. So we're going through a period of, of rationalisation, bringing different products and groupings together. So there'll be a heat pump manufacturing excellence, electric heating, domestic white goods, and all those different areas will be focusing and bringing together their own operations to make them more efficient and better position to grow in the market. So there's a lot of familiar brands there for you. We are a manufacturer, so we're dotted all around the world. We're quite heavily based around the UK. Most of our electric heating product comes from Ireland, northern and southern, so we have a foot in and a foot out of the, the Brexit camp. Our heat pumps are manufactured in a, a town called Kulmbach which is about two hours east of Munich and we even manufacture a lot of the components that go into the heat pump so there, there are, there's a whole supply chain issue there. What we do tend to find that is the, the cheaper perhaps more commodity product the plastic units fan heaters and some of the retail product that sort of product needs to come from a, a market such as China but as a business we've invested and we actually have our own manufacturing uh, facility over there as well. And the idea of that is just to try and ensure a, a quality of production. Give you a bit of a, a bit of a brief overview of the sort of market areas that we would be uh, interested in, and maybe that gives you a bit, bit more of an overview. Direct acting panel heaters, so that's an instantaneous heater. You switch it on, you switch it off. It will have a variety of different controls, time, temperature, and zone. And you could spend fifty pounds or four hundred and fifty pounds. A lot of that just really comes down to aesthetics. They'll, they'll similarly do, pretty much do the same job. Within your um, domestic SAP and SAP and SPEM, you're an assessor. Yeah, 
So a direct acting heater is 100% efficient at point of use. So as JJ says, one kilowatt in, one kilowatt out. How you make it look, how you control it, that there are certain extras. As long as you've got time, temperature and zone control. But this just gives me a little opportunity to mention the latest raft of EU legislation that came in on the 1st of January. So the 1st of January, we were uh, required to comply with Lot 20. Lot 20 effectively means when you read through all the legislation, as a business or as an industry, we can no longer manufacture a direct acting heater with a mechanical thermostat and a mechanical time clock. So we would provide electronic thermostats and electronic time control, which we've been doing for some considerable time. But the legislation pushes us further to bring in other, other, other technologies that will give you a, a, a way of providing a greater efficiency in use. So that might be a window sensing technology. For example, if the window opens, a heater can switch itself off so that you're not heating the garden. Um, distance technology, so you could be away from the property, so you might have access through a web portal and, and, a, and an app-based control. Um, and the other feature would be uh, adaptive start. So it's a way of predicting when you might need the heat. It's a little bit like weather compensation. So if you want your, uh, your bedroom to be 18 degrees at uh, 6.30 in the morning, you program the heater with a normal time, time frame, and it will work out when it needs to come on to hit the target temperature at the set time. So my home gas heating comes on at, a, at six o'clock every day, just so I know that it's going to be warm enough whenever I might get up at 6.30 or seven o'clock. It takes a little bit of the guesswork out of it. So in, in theory, it's, it's a way of providing some level of automation over something that we might not be able to do accurately ourselves. It's on the fringes of efficiency, but all those technologies can be built into a product to make them more efficient in use. So whilst you can still buy old and existing product, moving forward more and more, those products should be more efficient in use. Any questions on lot 20? It's, a, it's an extremely big subject, but there is documentation that I could make available to help on that. We manufacture hot water cylinders, so direct hot water cylinders with electrical elements, indirect water cylinders that you can add onto gas systems, and of course heat pump cylinders as well and all of those are made in our Irish facility. An extension of cylinders, and it's extremely useful product with regard to Part L compliance, is a hot water only heat pump. And it is what it says, it's a domestic cylinder <coughs> with a miniaturised air source heat pump built into the top. As JJ said, you, when you use a heat pump, you put a kilowatt of energy into it, you get more energy out of it because of the compressor. As a compliance methodology for, for reducing carbon output on new build, it's extremely attractive because you're offsetting carbon that you might put into water heating 365 days a year and you, and you can dramatically reduce that. It's also a way of, of applying um, uh, improvements to your water heating in existing property. So again, you'll, you'll find an improvement in your EPC because this product will generate less carbon and it will cost you less to run. So I guess we would all, all be of a mind that a, a, an, an existing reduced SAP EPC predominantly is based around running cost and new build is more to do with carbon. So again, it's, it's, it allows me just to sort of start filtering the, the, the idea and the message of, well, how can heat pumps help, help Partel compliance? Have you retrospectively did those? Yes. There is one, there is always a, a compromise with these things in that to enable the air source heat pump to work, you've got to have air, but it has to be externally vented for supply and extract. So you would be running some form of ducting to an external facade. So yes, it can be done, um, but you would you have to allow for that and either build the ducting into a ceiling void or block it in in some way. Have you installed any of the buildings? Because I guess that, that's where it would be tricky with ducting and venting. I would say no. Yeah. Not that I would be aware of. It's, it's, it's been predominantly a domestic product. Yeah. Um, a lot of one off. We, we've had it in the UK for about a year, okay. but we've been selling them in France for about eight years. Okay. Um, so it's a market that's grown up over there, about 8,000 units a year. So we see it very much as a, as a residential retrofit. You know, had some inquiries like school kitchens where they've got 
traditional electric, a couple of 300 litre electric cylinders that <coughs> are becoming defunct. So we, we would work in those areas. It's, it's just very difficult because you've got to drill holes in things. Yeah. And the system's not designed to take internal air. So you would imagine if you've just spent an amount of money to heat the inside of the property, and you take that heat and, and put it into your air source heat pump, what eventually comes out is cold air. Yeah. So you, it, and it's just not designed for that. So you would ha need to want to do it if you had in some sort of external plant room or something. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I mean it, it, it's really um, designed in terms of the, the physical capacity of the unit. So we have a 200 and a 270 litre unit. So the 200 litre unit uh, heated to 60 degrees will deliver about 300 litres <coughs> at 40 degrees at the tap. So. So yeah, you would have no problem putting that in, in one, two, three bedroom apartment, three bed semi. It's about the having enough capacity, you know, 45 litres per person per day, that sort of figure. So it's specifically designed around that. Heat pumps, which we'll obviously talk about a bit more. I don't know how appropriate it is for, for the people we're talking here is that, again, as part of the growth strategy, um, we've just completed an, and the purchase and integration of a company <coughs> called Ability Projects. They're based in Pool. Ability Projects are the UK's largest manufacturer of fan core units. You might wonder exactly where that fits in. So fan core is being a way of delivering heating and cooling in apartments. There's a huge market for these in, in London also delivering heating and cooling in smaller commercial. So this would be a water-based system. There's a lot of fan core units that, that use refrigerant to deliver heating and cooling through air conditioning. This would be a water-based system. So this allows us then to incorporate heat pump technology, distributing hot and cold water into a, a, a really good way of, of delivering heating and cooling. So it, it, it allows us access into another market, potentially the commercial market and the high-end residential, where, for example, Central London with London Plan, we'll probably, we probably won't be delivering direct acting electric heaters because they're considered too dirty in terms of carbon. So if you want to start achieving Part L less 35%, you're really talking about other systems, uh, district networks, centralised heating and heat pumps. But it, it allows an, an extension of what we do in the conversations that we have within the, the m and services market. And when we talk about centralised distribution systems uh, and, and the residential market specifically, um, I've got an event next, <coughs> ne next Thursday in Birmingham where we're delivering to sort of a, a mechanical electrical audience, uh, delivering our, our new system which is called Xeroth. Um, Xeroth predominantly is an apartment based high rise system for delivering heating hot water and potentially comfort cooling. A traditional high-rise building might have gas-fired central plant, deliver a high temperature loop around the building, use heat interface units on an apartment by apartment basis to deliver the heating. We're talking about having a low temperature loop and every apartment having a heat pump built into it. So effectively it would be a, a, a ground sourced heat pump built very much in the shape of a, <coughs> a, a fridge freezer that will be built into the services cupboard potentially with the ventilation system and a washing machine and there are a number of system benefits to that when you add it all up together it's certainly in terms of energy efficiency and carbon so again we're extending <coughs> the range of where heat pumps can be applied so traditionally a, a ground source heat pump you would appreciate has possibly a big loop to generate the energy this also has a big loop but it's just built into the center of the building and there are a, a number of attractive reasons why you might do that um, it's a way of reducing uh, overheating within high rise um, and has the potential to save money, save carbon. But it's very system specific. So if you're in SIBSI or building services, you might be interested in, in a product like, uh, like Xeroth. So as far as the CPD content is concerned, how heat pumps can help your project pass planning and building regulations. Who's dealing with heat pumps currently? Has anybody had any recent dealings for heat pumps? It doesn't surprise me really. Um, I think out of the room with JJ having a heat pump, that's probably representative of how heat pumps are, are, are kind of 
calculated across the country. In terms of heating, uh, space heating and hot water, gas accounts for about 90% of all heating and hot water, which probably comes as no surprise. Electric heating, which is our general industry, which is, would be in terms of storage and direct heating, probably accounts for about 9% of the market. The other 1% is everything else. It's heat pumps, it's biomass and, and, and other systems. So you can see that the numbers aren't going to be great. We, you know, we can quote numbers like uh, Woolsey, for example, sell and deliver a, a gas boiler every 30 seconds, 24 hours a day as part of their group. So you can see, you see where the scale is. From, from our manufacturing facility, we deliver about 60,000 heat pumps a year globally. So it, it's, it's a different scale. So the point about that is that you, you have to create a market environment where that can potentially become attractive. Um, so one of the first things that you're likely to come across is that heat pumps are perceived to be expensive or certainly more expensive than a traditional gas installation. And that perception is true. So to create the environment where um, heat pumps can become more attractive, <coughs> we, talk, we talk about drivers and incentives. So the driver is planning requirements and building regulations, which since 2006, and you probably have worked within them, have become more onerous, more difficult to achieve, year-on-year -year reduction in carbon. There are there, outside of that, standards such as BREAM, which want you to sort of uplift the quality of what you build. And of course, the calculation methodology, such as SBEM for commercial and SAP for domestic. So hopefully when I come on to the SBEM, if you've got any comments, please, please help me. Incentives. Well, heat pumps don't really work at current in the market without some sort of financial incentive. They are more expensive to buy and install. There is renewable heat incentive for retrofitting heat pumps to a domestic property. There is non-domestic renewable heat incentive for commercial properties, enhanced capital allowances for pumps, and the attraction of potentially lower running costs. Again, I'll refer to that later. We've got some figures that we would demonstrate. The two combined help to start creating an environment where heat pumps could and should be more attractive. And that's without going into decarbonisation of the grid and those sort of areas, which hopefully I'll come back to later. From a CPD perspective, we would always start with what is a heat pump. Um, a heat pump is a device that transfers heat from a colder area to a hotter area by using mechanical energy as in a refrigerator. This diagram here explains to us the vapour compression cycle, which is the mechanical way of describing what a heat pump is. It is a, a fridge in reverse, simply. There are five main components starting with the refrigerant that runs around the heat pump system. Is anybody particularly familiar with the heat, the heat pump vapour compression cycle? Okay, it's the extent of my knowledge because I'm not mechanical, but what you have is you, you collect some energy from somewhere. So this will be the air, the ground or some water. Inside the system here is refrigerant. You, you push the refrigerant through the evaporator which interacts with the energy that you've gathered for externally and the uh, evaporator turns the cold refrigerant into a cold gas. Now, where energy is consumed in the heat pump is at the compressor, so this is the point where it's, it's costing you. So the compressor, com compressor takes the cold gas, compresses it and turns it into a hot gas. Um, if you take a bicycle pump and put your thumb over the end and, and you pump it, your thumb gets warm. It's the, same, it's the same principle. You compress something, it gets hot. The hot gas then is driven over a condenser, which interacts with your internal heating system, and there's a heat exchange. And that then allows you to deliver heating and hot water to the property. As the refrigerant goes over the condenser, it turns back into a cold gas, and then through the expansion valve, turns back into a cold liquid. And round and round we go. What's really important about the vapour compression cycle is that it, it kind of basically consists of three interrelated but not connected um, conveyor belts. You're gathering energy on this conveyor belt, you're converting it here and delivering it here. 
What is important about heat pumps is that the system, the design and the installation has that in mind in terms of flow rates and temperatures. If you don't put enough energy in here, you don't get enough energy out here. If you put too much energy in, the system overloads because it can't convert it quickly enough. So there is a fine balance when using a heat pump. It's not as simple as taking gas, burning it, and creating loads of heat, hot water and energy. It needs to be controlled. But with the control comes control over your carbon and control over your running cost. Whatever you do, always come back and consult with your manufacturer, supplier and an accredited person for installation. There would be always come back to whether whether it's a Mitsubishi or whoever, always talk to your manufacturer. And that becomes fairly apparent when we talk about efficiencies. OK with the vapour compression cycle, that's as, as mechanical as it gets. So this typically would be what an air source heat pump looks like. You will see them around and they will always have a fan here. Um, so with an air source heat pump it's going to collect its energy from the air. The fan drives the air across, across the, uh, the, the evaporator and, and that starts the cycle. <coughs> that's, as, that's as complicated as it gets. What you should, what you should note is that um, Positioning and sighting is important, as is the system design, in that uh, the air source heat pump will probably draw out about 7 degrees from the air that goes through it. So if you consider that the average UK air temperature is about 7 degrees, it could be quite cold. So we would expect to see a, a build-up of frost inside the unit. That's perfectly normal, perfectly acceptable. So built within the system would be a, um, a defrosting cycle. It will just run itself backwards to defrost itself. From a design perspective within heat pumps, we tend to work with, with buffer vessels. So we have a buffer vessel with your cylinder that allows us to store a small amount of energy. Now the buffer acts as a, as, a, uh, as a buffer between the outside and the inside. There's always a small store of energy that when the heating requirement kicks in on and off, there's a small store of energy that can be used while the heat pump then starts to build up the rest of it. And that store of energy can also be used by its, its hot water to filter back into the heat pump to, to help with the defrost cycle. The idea is that you're, you're just converting energy to put into hot water in the building. Ground source heat pump. The, our box looks slightly different, but what's inside it is exactly the same. Same types of components and the same vapour compression cycle. The ground source heat pump will gather its energy from the ground in two formats. It will either be a horizontal ground loop which will stretch out either in curly slinkies or a straight line out with pipework out and back. The space heating requirement and hot water requirement will, will denote how many loops and what size you need. A, a horizontal loop needs to be in the reach about a, a metre and a half deep. Generally across the UK the, the, the frost depth is about 80 centimetres, so you've always got to be below that. The alternative to that is a vertical borehole. We are literally drilling straight down into the ground. Um, from an advice perspective, it's the British Geological Survey that will tell you what type of ground you have. So that could be a limiting factor. If you don't have the right type of ground, you're not going to be boring down into it. But there are specialists out there that would help you as part of that process. What's the life expectancy of the pipe That's a good question. HDPE pipe, it'll last forever. Yeah, it doesn't degrade. Yeah, so as long as, as, long as um, as part of a setting to work, you you flush out the system and fill it correctly, you shouldn't have. Yeah, you shouldn't have a problem. So that brings us on to heat pump performance all sorts of things that can affect that. So if, if you've got debris within, the, within your ground source pipe system, that, that's going to cause you a problem. Heat pump performance is, is, it comes in two areas. Um, start with COP, which is the coefficient of performance, and that's just a measure of the useful energy transferred or delivered into the property divided by the total energy consumed. So that gives us a ratio. So for every kilowatt that I put into the compressor, I might get three kilowatts out. 
So with an air source heat pump, that is going to be entirely dependent on air temperature. The hotter the air temperature, the more energy there is, the easier it is to convert. And that is set out under the standard BSEN 14511. So from an M&E perspective, that's, that's one of the things that you should remember. What was found, and that was the, the kind of the denoting standard. So if you ask us for our most efficient air source heat pump, we can give you that. But the most efficient air source heat pump might work with an average air uh, temperature at 25 degrees. So is that realistic to expect the best performance in the UK climate? It might work really well in Greece and maybe not so good in, in Helsinki. As heat pumps came into the UK market in, in bigger numbers from let's say 15 years ago, that's something that has become a bit of a bit of an issue in the market in that heat pumps that were installed and delivered perhaps didn't quite perform to the level of expectation. I was expecting to get four kilowatts of heat for every kilowatt that I put in, and that was going to keep my costs down. This system I've calculated in, it's only giving me two and a half kilowatts for every kilowatt that I put in. And that's an issue with COP. COP as a, uh, as a measurement is a single spot measure, and we could give you dozens of different measures. So the measures would normally incorporate what air temperature are you expecting, and what flow rate are you going to put around your system? So there are a number of different flow rates. So it might be 40 degrees flow rate through the underfloor. Uh, it might be 55 degrees through a traditional radiator. So the issue with that is temperature. It's going to be easier for my heat pump taking air at 7 degrees to push it up to 40. But if I've got air at 7 degrees and I want to get it up to 55 for traditional radiators, it's got to work harder, so therefore it's going to use more energy. And, and some of those spot level calculations were perhaps misinterpreted or misused. So it would be very easy for somebody to tell you that you're going to get a really efficient system that perhaps doesn't deliver. So we would have a whole number of um, spot measures, air at minus 7, air at plus 7, water flow at 35, water flow at 55. And we have that information and data, as all manufacturers would do, and we would make that information available to you as, as, as the client or the customer or the designer. It's just really important to say that, that an air source heat pump can work comfortably down to minus 25 if it's designed and optimised for that market. And that's really important when we look at um, <coughs> where, and where you're installing the product. To make that situation more palatable and, and more accurate, um, we change building regs every four or five years and we hope that the system becomes more efficient. And the same with SBEM and SAP calculators. They've, they've been revised and refined to make the calculations for carbon more, 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 more reflective of the real situation. So to make this more realistic, um, a couple of years back, uh, the SCOP, which is the Seasonal Coefficient of Performance, or SPF, Seasonal Performance Factor, was, was introduced as a way of enhancing the, enhancing the method of calculation for efficiency of heat pumps. SCOP uses total energy transferred over total energy consumed over a season. So it could take a whole 12 month period and it will average out the performance of the product. So it's a much more attractive situation because it will take into account part load data. So part load data meaning that you don't need as much heating and hot water in October as January. And January requires a lot more energy than you would require in, in, in June. It takes into account the seasonal variations and, and makes it a much more accurate calculation. And we, all, we then always bring that to attention and that then becomes wrapped up into standard 14825. And the SCOP brings together a couple of other standards in terms of what, what system you're using to heat and what is the building. So it then becomes a building specific calculation. So that building in that location with that system should in calculation terms give you an efficiency of X. And that then becomes really important because those are the figures that you would want to use in your, your SBEM calculation or your SAP calculation. It's also important because um, the part load data or the seasonal variation differs right the way across Europe. So Europe has three separate climate data zones. We have uh, warm, which is based on Athens medium or moderate, which is based on Strasbourg, and cold, which is based on Helsinki. We're complicated in the UK. 
because we hit, we hit two of the climate zones. Pretty much um, the, there would be a line across the UK above Birmingham. So below Birmingham and below, the part load data calculation would allow for an Athens climate. So you might understand that in Devon and Cornwall, but perhaps not in West Brom, I don't know. Um, north of the line, you're in a moderate climate. So you have the same calculation methodology as Strasbourg. So again, this building specific calculation tells us that the same building in the same orientation, in the same environment, will differ between Exeter and Edinburgh, purely based on weather data. So it comes back to the, the standard 14825, it's building specific. Is that, is that something that you, have you come across that at all from, from your commercial calcs? Yeah. So again, it, it comes in line with this enhancement of the calculation methodology. It's much more accurate. So the, the figures that people were quoting 10 <coughs> years ago, are they realistic? Well, it's more realistic now. So when you ask a manufacturer for the cop, is that the worst case, the medium or the best case? It would, dep it would depend on the data. So if, if we gave you a figure for an air source heat pump with air at minus 7, it's not going to give you as, as, as high a performance as air at plus well, always quote something, always give you something. Well, in the UK, you would expect to see air at 7, water at 35. But the water at 35 will only be based on a, a, a flow around an underfloor system. So we would ask the question, and there's a calculation called MIS 3005 that is an official document that we would do a whole calculation for, but we would ask you the question, What's your build building? What are your U values? Where's it located? What heating systems are you installing? And those would have different impacts on the performance of the system. So you couldn't really <coughs> trust a cop. You have to go through. Well, you trust a cop because, because in, in the design facility, if you put air in at seven and run the flow around the system at 35, it will give you an efficiency. But it's, it's one specific spot. But the air is not going to be seven degrees all year round which is why SCOP is far more ac accurate. It, it, it's like, it, it'll, if, if you took the SCOP uh, of the air source heat pump against a COP <coughs> using an air at 25, it, it's, it's going to be worse. But if you took air at minus 7, the SCOP will be better because it's averaging out that climate <coughs> data for the UK. But it's just important, if you get the calculation right, then there's an expectation of what you're getting because that then feeds into, comes into the renewable heat incentive and then, then what you get back out for the heat you generate. So we would we always refer it back. It's just about making the data correct for the information provided. Because, and it just reiterates the point, not all heat pumps are equal. There are a couple of different ways in which manufacturers put their heat pumps together. What you tend to find is that the higher the output, the lower the level of performance. And again, the lower the output, the higher of the level of performance. And the performance level is your SCOP. The higher your SCOP, the less energy you consume for producing the heat that you want. <coughs> Therefore, is more efficient, and the money that you get back out of your financial incentives is, is maximised. Our heat pumps tend to fall in this category, higher performance at lower outputs. So from a ground source heat perspective, we go from 4 kilowatts up to 130. Air source, 4 up to, up to 60 kilowatt. Our product are monoblock, which means that you have the compressor that, that's built into them that are fixed speed. Heat pumps over 25 kilowatts all have two, two compressors in them so that the, heat, the, the, the compressors can work at a specific speed. So when they're on, they're 100% efficient because of the energy that they're using. So you get a maximum efficiency when they're running. And as part of the design process where we would use a buffer tank to store some energy, when the heat pump comes on, it can run for 30 minutes and it runs at its maximum efficiency and it fills the buffer. The buffer that can then provide you, you heating or hot water when you turn the tap on. As I say, some manufacturers sacrifice this performance level for bigger output. Sometimes you need a product with a bigger output for a particular project. We would like to say that we'll, we'll give you a number of smaller products and we'll bank them together and we'll switch our compressors on 
to meet the load requirement. Predominantly, any large, large size heat pump that you get from uh, companies like Seat, they are literally just a great big box with a number of, with a number of different heat pumps built into them. But it's a specific market. <coughs> Within the, within the heat pump market, there are a lot of inverter-driven products. So the idea being is that you, you modulate the speed of the compressor to meet the, the heating and load requirements. So you can ramp it up and pull it down, dependent on, on your requirements. What happens is you modulate and reduce the output. You reduce the efficiency. So is that a good thing? Maybe on, on much smaller products. What you also find is that you can't, mod you, you can't deal with the, the, the noise so much. So as I say, inverter products cannot be optimised for noise due to the wide range of compressor operating frequencies. When the compressors come on in a fixed speed monoblock unit, they're on at a specific speed at a specific noise level, so you can deal with that. When you look at uh, efficiency of a heat pump, the key areas that we're looking at is the SCOP and how that affects running cost and the production of carbon, because the, they are two key, key figures that, that fall within your, your, your calculation. If I run through this, we, we, we've made a comparison using uh, the SAP tool, and what we want to demonstrate is the effect of, of different efficiencies of, of heat pumps and compare them against gas. So we, we, we're suggesting a 90% efficient gas boiler, which is pretty realistic, paying about four pence a unit. And at different efficiencies, across the board, once your SCOP is calculated using standard 14825, heat pumps at all these levels show a lower running cost. So again, from a, 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 a user perspective, that's attractive. The carbon produced, and bearing in mind that carbon generated from gas is measured at about 216 grams per kilowatt, per kilowatt of heat produced, Electricity is calculated at 518 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour produced. So electric is <coughs> quite, has quite a high carbon content compared to gas. <coughs> but using the efficiency of the heat pump cycle, an average heat pump with an efficiency of 3 to 1 or 300% still outperforms the gas 90% gas boiler in terms of about a 25% reduction in terms of carbon. So carbon is therefore, for, I think we'd recognise, a huge driver in terms of new build. It, it's, it's one of the big tick boxes. As the efficiency of the heat pump increases, three and a half up to four and a half, at, at, at an efficiency of 450 to one, so it's for every kilowatt I'm, I'm putting into the compressor, I'm getting four and a half kilowatts of heat out the other side. The running cost in this example is 50%. So certainly as an owner-operator, that would start to become attractive. But what's interesting from our perspective <coughs> as a business, um, as, a, as a manufacturer of electric space heating products, and of course within that we incorporate heat pumps as well, is, um, is anybody aware of the SAP consultation of December 2016? Which is clearly some time in the past. So the SAP consulta consultation 2016 was put together to inform the government and BRE about um, carbon intensity of fuel going forward for the next Part L set of regulations. So bear in mind we're now eight, we're heading towards 18 months further on and we're still waiting for the next uh, Part L to come out, which should be later this year. The advice to BRE and government was due to the changing environment of how we produce energy. So in the last 10 years, we, have gener we generate more energy from solar PV, uh, from wind and wave technology. But also we're reducing our reliance and content of energy or electricity generated from fossil fuels. There were, I think it was two days last year where we didn't produce any electricity from coal. Uh, and by 2025, coal-fired power stations will be gone. Um, so you, you would imagine, you would see how there is less carbon being put into the, the generation of electricity. 
So that is, is and will be represented when Part L comes out next time round. That will also then feed into your Part L calculator, SBEM and uh, your SAP calculator. What it means is there'll be, from let's say today to tomorrow, a 23% reduction in the amount of carbon that is emitted by the same building using electricity. So if you're using a lot of electricity to uh, run your heating or your hot water or potentially your heat pump, there's a further reduction for that same building. Now, we're obviously calculating these figures and until it actually hits in the calculator, you can't get the benefit. But from the sort of audience we talk to about um, uh, new built properties and commercial developments, we're talking a year and 18 months ahead. But what it means is that um, a further reduction from, a, again, a very average 300% efficient product. So you've gone from a 25% reduction in CO2 over gas to about 42%. And at the high end product, which would be your ground source, up to a 63% reduction in carbon. It makes it really attractive to consider heat pumps in your project. It might well mean that um, you don't have to spend money in another area that isn't working for you. Do you like PV or not? I don't know. PV is a great way of offsetting carbon. But of course, what, what, what we do want you to have, we want you to have build good buildings in good locations, build them to good standards, and then decide the best way of heating and potentially cooling them. I was going to make another point, but I've forgotten it, so I'm going to move on. So broadly, this hopefully re-emphasises running cost is attractive and it's extremely attractive in terms of carbon. Is, has anybody got any particular comment on that? Is that does that match with, with your thoughts? And in terms of initial cost, how does that rate to a gas conditioning system? OK, I'll, I'll, I'll expand on it later, but broadly you're talking about for an air source heat pump, up to, up to about £1,200 per kilowatt installed. So if you had a 10 kilowatt air source heat pump for an installation, you're looking at about £12,000. From, from a, a domestic RHI perspective, if you were retrofitting, the idea is, is that the seven year payment for producing green heat would pay for it, but you might have to pay the capital outlay up front. Ground source heat pump, are more expensive to install because you've got to have ex excavation, you've got to dig and drill. So you would be in the region of up to about £1,700 a kilowatt for a ground source heat pump. So in terms of the comparison against gas, you've got any sort of rough ballparks? Well, how much is a gas boiler? I mean, you, you, you could, in, in an average three bed semi, you could install a gas heating system for about £3,000. And if you've already got gas and it's your, your, your boiler has, you know, has broken down, and it, it's, it's extremely easy for about £800 to replace your gas boiler. You'd, have to have, you'd want a compelling reason why you would want to change that, to be honest. But if you're a self-builder or if you are off gas, you might be in a rural, you might want to just go green. Sorry, can I ask if a client, because building control would insist they've got to have short-term piles, uh, and, and it's London clay, and you know, they're sending people down for for five meters for whatever reason. Um, is that deep enough for, say, um, ground source? No, because you'd be looking at one or two hundred meters potentially. How many? One or two hundred meters. You, you're going down a long, long way. So that's, yeah, partly down planning conditions, but also down to the, the, the type of ground that you have. <laughs> But you know, when you talk about a vertical borehole, you can potentially generate up to about five watts per meter. A, a, a horizontal one is about three. So they, even within those systems, there will be you know, different efficiencies that you can gain. So again, you're looking for the right type of system. So if you're rur rural and you've, you've got a large, exter you know, a large field next to you, then yeah, it would be easier and cheaper to, to put horizontal loops. But again, it, it can be down to the specific project in a specific location. And like, you know, we, could, we come across jobs all the time where we're having, uh, for residential, difficulty achieving Part L compliance and the client or contractor wants to put PV on the roof, but the planning authority says we don't like the look of PV. So, so um, you know, where do you go from there? <coughs> um, so everybody's looking for a, an avenue and an opening. 
we would always go back and, and say, build with fabric first, build a good building, which is why within the SAP calculator now you have fees compliance, fabric energy efficient, fabric energy efficiency standard. So you, you can only build to certain U values. So within that building, you know, U values cannot be above a certain level. So that gets us over the point around, you can't build a crappy, poorly insulated, poorly airtight building and put PV on the roof and, and, and get it to pass. You've got to build to certain U value standards. And that, that again, it's a, it's a further tightening of the rules and regulations that we have to work within. But if you've got an airtight, well insulated building with reasonably low heat losses, why do you want to burn gas at, at, at 70, 80 degrees and run that around your house? Why not use a heat pump? for the smaller amounts of energy that you require and do it, do it more efficiently, cost you less to run and you produce less carbon. So it becomes attractive. Um, for the air sources, in terms of the aesthetics of them, can, can you screen them at all? Because I know you're obviously they're taking in the air, so you need to provide a clear path there, but <laughs> is there a way of like, sort of how does the enclosure put them into them? There are, so there are companies that will, um, uh, that will put cowls around them, but you've got to allow the airflow. Yeah. Um, so that's it. So if, if you, I, I was talking to a guy earlier, and I've seen them where they're in a back garden, yeah. and somebody's put trellis all the way around it and blocked it in because it's ugly. Yeah. And and that's where you get the system freezes up. Yeah. I, I've I've not got it on this presentation, but we've got a um, a picture of. of right. Can I just say that my heat pump looks really nice. <laughs> I like looking at it. We, well, we, we, can, we can deliver a heat pump in, I think it's 16,000 RAL colours, oh, okay. if you want it. Okay. You might have to wait 12 months and it'll cost you three times as much, but you can have, pretty much have them in any colour you like. Okay, We've just launched in Germany um, a, a product called System M, and it's a square box and you can have almost any finish. So you can have a, a wooden pa slotted panel down the side, you can have in any colour you like. Yeah. And the way it's designed has the correct vents in the correct places, so it, it doesn't look like a grey box, it, it's, it'll blend into the environment. Yeah. I, I can't show you now because I don't have the access to it. But it's expensive. But you can, you can also um, have all sorts of screen printing and, and uh, the one we had on display at, a, a, at an exhibition in Germany, they were actually had an LED display on the one side, so they were, they was, it was talking about the product on the product. Okay. It's a shame the builders don't think about where they position them sometimes on the architecture. Side near us, where they put it in, where the bifolding doors are, the air source. It's right next to it. Not just next to it, it actually overhangs the bifolding doors. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> I've got a couple of pictures at the end, and that's it's exactly the point I was I was going to make. Is that it's we we can do so much as a manufacturer. We we can we can make a, a variety of different quality of product at different price points. We can provide the advice, design, and guidance and information. Ultimately, somebody's got to put it in. Um, if you follow the guidance, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, there are the, issues with that. Certainly in the village that we're in, there's uh, quite, quite a few ground-sized pumps and heat air pumps. People just really struggle with air to figure out how they work. Yeah. And they don't know how to put them in. They don't know how to put them in. They don't know how to put not given them the right information, so they get their new half a million pound house, but they don't know how to use yeah. it. Um, but also when it does go wrong, it doesn't seem to be anybody that really knows how to fix it, sort of thing, and that seems to be another issue. Yeah, I, th I think over the years there, there probably haven't been enough qualified mm. and good quality people out there. So we only work with a small number of regular repeat, repeat customers. Um, no, on the new estate, all that heat went off in the middle of winter, and nobody knew how to, to get yeah. it. Uh, and, it was and awful. It's down to the installer. The installer, there should be a warranty that goes with it. So we warranty all of our product. You could buy a seven-year warranty package from us that would allow that to happen. Um, but it is, it is a problem because we, there aren't as many... Um, but as an end user, if I, if I haven't got one, but if I had a product that I couldn't operate, I'm not going to tell the gentleman next door to me to go and buy one. Yeah. Because I'm not going to know what to do with it. I'm not going to it in his house because I'm in the bottom the whole time. It's incumbent on the industry to improve that. Yeah. So better installers, qualified installers, MCS approved, the guys who've had the training. Because obviously what we don't want is we don't, we don't want to approve a company for installing our product and then they subcontract it out somewhere. So in terms of setting to work, in a lot of instances we will, we will go to site and we'll 
double check that situation. Um, so yeah, we, we want the, the product to be as simple and basic to use in situ, but to deliver the efficiency. And it is, it, it is a problem. We don't have 12,000 Corgi engineers going around that can respond within 24 hours. But it will improve. So as, as heat pump technology gets taken up in the market, that market will grow. The, the, gra the, the grant that is available is effectively the, the uh, renewable heat incentive. There were some grants a few years ago that were, would give you a part payment towards the capital cost and then a small level of grant, but the <coughs> government decided it was easier to off offer the payment over the seven years or, the, or 20 years commercially based on the amount of heat you produce. So that m means that you've got to design a good system, in install it correctly and use it correctly to maximise it. Otherwise you could, you could have had a grant that paid for most of the product and never use it. Mm. And it's then not, not the right way. It, it comes back to the argument about having a, a crappy house and um, putting PV on the roof because you can cut out a load of carbon. And we would never, you know, we would never ad advocate that. Okay, yeah. But you no, know, PV panels, they're the ones that are integrated into the, um, in, into, to see, into the tiles. It, it yeah. Look good. Yeah, yeah. You know, in the right environment. So I hope <coughs> I've convinced you about running cost and carbon reduction. Extremely important. Planning regulations and local considerations. Um, locally to this neck of the woods, can anybody tell me... Are we going beyond Partel in Warwickshire, Leamington, round and about? Is anybody being pushed towards looking at going beyond Partel? Or Bristol. Bristol. 10% in Bristol. Um, I've got 10% in Milton Keynes. London plan, obviously, we're, we're looking at our centralised system at less 35%. Local conditions, and a lot of that's obviously started with, I forget how, 20 years ago, the Merton Rule in London, uh, and it's, it's all devolved from that. So at least Partel gives us a, a baseline standard. I, mean, so I, I, I find in Birmingham, Midlands area, there doesn't seem to be too much of a desire to go beyond. I, I think that, that's, that's an economics thing. If you push people too far, they just won't spend the money and invest. Bristol, 10%. I've got a, a, a small project for nine of the hot water heat pumps um, that have been designed in by an architect in that particular instance. Mm -hmm. And with the hot water heat pump and a small amount of PV on the roof, they've been able to demonstrate Partel less 10%. I've got a project in Milton Keynes, which is 139 <coughs> apartments, which would be a new build block. They came to us with a conundrum that they'd got a centrified gas, gas system with heat interface units. And the, uh, they were advised by a consultant that they could save a million pounds by putting in direct electric heating, which is entirely possible. Replace your centrified system, put in direct electric heating, you therefore fail part L. Yeah, that, that's the simple answer. So they have a couple of ways of doing it. PV on the roof, they just didn't have enough room for PV on the roof because the building's too tall. Um, I suggested that they could look at instantaneous hot water. Wasn't attractive because they wanted to put baths in, in most of the apartments, so you can't provide enough hot water with an instantaneous hot water unit. So the alternative which we brought to the market last year was the, the hot water heat pump. The, I was talking to the domestic energy assessor a couple of weeks ago and using a block compliance methodology where you add up all of the carbon for the building and divide it across ev everywhere, that they've achieved Partel less 12.8% without PV on the roof, which resolves a, a, a structural issue because putting 60 kilowatts of PV on the roof adds a lot of weight uh, and is complicated in terms of what else is on the roof. So that simplified that as a project. And they subsequently rolled it out on a number of other jobs that we're looking at as well. So, you know, from a purely a part L compliance perspective, heat pump technology is proving to be quite attractive. They've got to overcome the issue of the supply and extract and how they coordinate ducting with all the various other services. As it stands at the moment in the market, that's the only way they're going to get compliance. So they're committed to that and, and they'll, they'll, they'll make it work one way or the other. So local conditions. So we, we, we come across different arrangements in different areas.
part L obviously being the driver, L1 and L2. L2A actually makes it a consideration that you look at heat pumps as part of a, a commercial new build, that it should form part of the feasibility study and strategy. And, and we see it more and more now where there is a whole section on uh, renewable technologies, PV, biomass, heat pumps, and, and looking at those considerations. SBEM being the tool with which we calculate carbon. <coughs> the idea that you take, we talked about the specific building and the specific location. So your SAP tool calculator is going to say, well, this building should emit no more than X amount of carbon, and that's your target. The building emission rate or the dwelling emission rate is what you're actually going to be emitting. So within the fabric energy efficiency standards, etc., you want to be becoming below the standard. Can I ask what, what, what then SBEM system you're using? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not a user. Uh, which version? Yeah. Okay. So there are a number of different brands and names, but they're all designed to calculate CO2. And, and the, the number cruncher calculator in the middle of it is a, is a locked system, isn't it? And it's just the software around it that you use. So you've got Elmhurst or whatever. I think we find more and more that... Um, the SAP and energy assessors are being asked to help with design considerations. Would you say that's fair? I can't. This, this building has failed. What can I do about it? Do you find yourself making suggestions? Um, sometimes, yeah. yeah. You've got to come in right at the design stage these days. Yeah. Now, I've got student accommodation problems. We've got a 10% target from the local authority. The developers just design yourself to put a whole bank of PV on top, which is why I'm asking the cost for air source heat pumps. We could talk about that afterwards, because yeah. there, there will be a, there will be ways of doing that to help help minimise the cost. But if we could ch chat afterwards, that'd yeah, be right. Sure, yeah. Okay. But yeah, so so yeah, it, it has an impact on design, whereas it n shouldn't necessarily be. But if it's just a case of tweaking a wall U value, that would be good advice. And then we come on to just the specific about the SBEM screenshot. We've got two sc screens here, and, and what's absolutely vital is that within the SAP tool calculator, there are a lot of defaults. Generally, if you use a, use a default efficiency, you won't maximise the performance of the property in terms of carbon, which is why we've spent a lot of time and effort uh, talking to the client, understanding their, their requirements in terms of heating and how they're going to distribute. We've done their MIS 3005 calculation. We've produced a, a, an efficiency report. Our heat pump is going to be 332% efficient. So for every kilowatt I put in, I'm getting 3.3 kilowatts out. The default for a heat pump is 2.5, so 250% efficient. My heat pump will give us 330% efficient. So I'm going to be producing less carbon than the predicted building, which is always going to be a positive. And that obviously then feeds into the running cost. So that's pretty much the only thing to say about that is, is there's, there's a lot of work that goes into just one single figure. And if, 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 that is, if that's incorrect, and obviously what we, we don't want people using the COP figures, it's got to be the SCOP figure under standard 14825. So a lot of work goes into simply producing one number which, which can have an impact on, on performance of your dwelling or your building. Comment on BRIAM, so extra and over part L, you might get asked to consider BRIAM. Anybody a BRIAM assessor? Okay. Local authority new build must be at the highest standard, outstanding, and uh, local authority refurbs must be at excellent. So the government is committed to keeping and upgrading and, and keeping their buildings up to date. And heat pumps play a part in that because of running cost. Uh, and carbon in terms of retrofit. So we've been, I think we've been, we've been quite successful with school refurbs, um, school extensions. And so it's a great way of hitting the carbon targets. BRIAM awards points for different areas. Heat pumps fit under the en energy efficiency category. So, so you can see there are quite a lot of points available here. So heat pumps can give you up to 12 points for efficiency. 
Most heat pump systems can be monitored by BMS, ours can. It's worth a point. And it's a low and zero carbon technology. <coughs> and as I say, there are credits in there for considering the feasibility. Part L2 asks you to do that anyway. What's interesting for us is that there's also another category at the bottom under innovation. Innovation for a heat pump system is about using waste heat and waste energy. So if there is some heat being dissipated somewhere that you could possibly get your hands on and use, that would be considered innovative. We've got a, a pilot project with Viola, who are the waste company. Uh, we have a ground source heat pump with a loop installed in a, a landfill site. So they're currently running a loop through the landfill, the, 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 the compacted waste, and seeing what heat they can draw out of it and how useful that might be. So currently it's, it's, it's heating some offices. But they've got, a, they've got a tricky balance to strike in that um, landfill has to be a, maintained at a certain temperature for it to decompose and let the gases come out. So if we took too much heat out, that might actually prevent the process. But an interesting pilot. We've got um, an air source heat pump with National Grid that is mounted about 10 metres up uh, on, on um, uh, a pylon next to a transformer. So the transformer's given off masses of heat and energy. So the air source heat pump has been mounted next to it to draw the heat off, and that provides heating and hot water to a set of offices. Again, it's considered an innovative way of doing it. If we could go into the market and really enhance the hot air coming out of the London Underground, and there's lots of talk about it in the industry. You know, if, you can, if you can resolve the overheating issue in the underground, it could be worth a fortune. Now, a lot of the heat that would come out of the underground is pretty low grade, 20, 30 degrees, so you can't heat buildings with it. But with heat pumps, we'll gladly take 30 degrees and turn it to 60 at three, four, five hundred percent efficient. We got involved about four years ago in a project in Scotland, which was student accommodation, about 700 units which would quite literally downstream uh, in terms of sewage from whichever city, I think it might have been Edinburgh. Sewage runs through the system at about 20 to 25 degrees. I can't say that for sure because I've never experienced it, but we're reliably informed about 20, 25 degrees. So a heat pump can convert 20 degrees to 40, 50, 60 extremely efficiently. Um, and effectively what it was talked about was just running the ground loop through the sewage. And there was uh, the size of the of the town city was there was almost an inexhaustible supply of waste. The other little free additional thing that you get with heat pumps, if you reverse them, you turn them back into a fridge. And what a fridge does, it extracts heat from inside and throws it back outside, which is why the back of your fridge is always hot. By reversing your, your, your heat pump, certainly with a ground source heat pump, you can extract heat from inside the building or the dwelling. With a ground loop, what that will actually do, and all you're doing is you're just running pump energy, there's no compression cycle, you're just circulating fluid. What that gives you then a chance is actually it helps to put the energy back into the ground, so actually helping to recharge the ground, which is a nice little free extra. And that was the question I was going to ask. When you, when you do a, a ground source, you're going to lose <coughs> heat out of the ground. How does it, does it okay. Happen? From a ground source heat pump, specific you, you it's not geothermal so if you want geothermal you've got to go down about five kilometers so we're talking one two hundred meters 90 percent of the energy that comes out of the ground for a ground source heat pump comes from the sun and most of that comes through rain so as, as rain hits the ground rain can be extremely cold but it, it has a temperature that helps so it's mainly the sun and rain that comes into the ground that keeps keeps it warm the system would be designed in such a way that you don't take too much heat from a specific area. So you wouldn't have five boreholes right <coughs> next to each other. They would be sequenced and spaced. So there's a lot of work that goes into working out how deep, or how much energy do you need, how deep do you go, and how far apart do you space the holes. But, but it would then be designed such that, you, that during the winter you wouldn't, you wouldn't take too much energy out because the ground would physically freeze. Then what you have is, is the summertime is a recharging process because you need less heat and hot water. But if you can comfort cool, you just uh, uh, put energy back into the ground. What we would, would say, if you're, if you're going to comfort cool, we would advise people against a horizontal loop. Because what you then find is the ground, because it's only a metre and a half down, the ground actually gets too hot and can potentially dry out. So the loop doesn't like dry ground, it likes 
wet, moist ground that, that allows a lot of heat transfer. So again, there are design issues involved there. Does that answer your question? I'm sure it does. But the soil conditions must make a lot of difference. I'm, I'm imagining clay doesn't transfer heat in the same way as, as yeah. the soil. I mean, I, I don't yeah, so the British Geological Survey yeah. gives guidance on that, yeah. as do the professionals in, in, in borehole design. So you have to get those professionals in. I pretty much, I'll, I'll wrap up fairly quickly, but I'll give you an example in terms of how funding and payment can affect a project. If you took an air source heat pump with a 350% efficiency, um, sized at 100 kilowatt, at 1,200 pounds, that's going to cost you about 120,000 pounds to install. The running cost we calculate at 5714 and you're earning about two and a half pence per kilowatt of heat produced over 20 years, which gives you £5,000 a year in terms of RHI payment for 20 years. So that gives you about £100,000. So it's a bit short in terms of, of, of paying for itself. So this, this system would be cheaper to run than the gas equivalent. So you have to include the running cost saving as part of that calculation. So it'll do the job, but it's a long-term investment. Ground source is a bit more attractive because the efficiency would be higher, the running cost would be lower, but there's a two-tier tariff for the payment, uh, and the two-tier tariff is therefore to, to, to limit people just switching the thing on and just burning energy and, and, and claiming extra money. It averages to about 7.8 pence per kilowatt of heat produced over 20 years, which is going to give you about £15,000 a year. <coughs> So £15,000 a year against a, an installation cost of, say, 170000 is about an 11-year payback. So you've got nine years of potential profit on the back of it. Plus, it doesn't take into account the fact that it still costs you less to run anyway. So certainly from an, an owner-operator perspective, that, that's a really attractive investment. So go back to try and reiterate all those main points about you know, how how buildings, um, how heat pumps can affect your Part L planning. The SCOP is the killer figure, standard 14825. It calculates the seasonal efficiency of the product. And when you consider that not all heat pumps are equal from different manufacturers, that's an extremely important start point. There are credits to be gained for BREAM and other building standards. Heat pumps work well in... in uh, in buildings with a high proportion of heating and hot water load. So we do a lot of work with McCarthy and Stone in Churchill Retirement Living. Churchill Retirement Living would lend itself to a lot of people being in the same place at the same time. As you say, heat pump performance differs. The heat pump performance will differ from manufacturer to manufacturer. We can prove that they will cost you less to run and they will produce less carbon. <coughs> and not only that, when Part L comes in, hopefully later this year, carbon for electric reduces further and that really starts to bring us back into the market with direct heating and, and hot water heat pumps and the mix of technologies so we're quite excited about that sort of thing don't forget that SCOP has an impact on running costs and they also attract RHI funding and that's part of the balancing act of creating the right, in, right environment out there for heat pumps I'm glad that the lady here brought up about siting and positioning. So I had these <coughs> couple of slides in earlier. So we've got a we've got a, 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 a file called Hall of Shame, where we've been, where, where our engineers have been to site because we get the phone call because it says Dimplex on the box. Your your heat pump isn't working. If you get everything right, you shouldn't have a problem. What you've got here is three 60 kilowatt air source heat pumps. It's a commercial commercial installation. So we've done our design, the M&E guy, the architect, uh, the installer has come along and they've got a certain amount of space. And it looks quite nice because they're all in a row, like soldiers. Um, and I mentioned earlier that an average air source heat pump takes out about seven degrees from the air. So we, we start at seven here and we're at zero here and minus seven here. And the system falls over because it can't then deliver the heat, the heat is required. So that all the hard work that went into that, the, the, the then consideration, you know, whether it was uh, advice in terms of the way in which the layout was from an architect or the M&E services guy didn't necessarily you know, make that consideration. If you had three gas boilers in a plant room, it, it wouldn't matter. You could have them 10 yards apart or right next to each other. That's extremely important. Um, that was about the, the, 
the, the best that could be done because that was all the space that was available. So at least there was less exchange and transfer of air. It's extreme, yeah, just extremely important that we, we link all the different services together and we're really kind of on that in terms of a, of a supplier. You know, we want that close relationship with the guy who actually taps it and switches it on. Location. So we go back to the bifold doors. So we've got an air source heat pump here that kind of it's a bit it's nicely tucked away, but the, the door's struggling and when the doors open it's just it's just driving air everywhere. Um, <coughs> clearances, extremely important. We, we we denote certain clearances locations. Um, and previously in our instructions we had a a cutaway picture of an air source heat pump that showed you all the various dimensions and the sighting and, and the picture of the wall was cut away. And this, this guy took quite, it took literally, he, he built it away from his house from a noise perspective, but he built the cutaway wall. And, and it's, a, it's a perfect installation. But he, he, so you can go, I don't know, I'm not sure where you go with that. But it's just to sort of, to make the point is that, that there are a lot of considerations. Talk to an approved installer, talk to, a, talk to your manufacturer and, and be as close to that as you can because we don't want the system to fail. Do you give warranty? Uh, do a lot of manufacturers in general give a manufacturer's warranty oh, yeah. that covers the whole installation or no. does that lie with the installer? So, we're just inter interested in that. Yeah. This, this bit here, that bit, there's nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. There's too much that, can go, that we can't affect. Like we, we, we never told the guy to put it there. Um, you know, we never told them to put it there. So the, the, the installation of the, the heating system is down with, with, with your installer. If there is a problem with the heat pump, then yeah, you know, it'll be either one or two years or an extended warranty. And all manufacturers would do the same. But we want to know what, what, what the fault is. And we go to so many sites, um, uh, one where the, where the system kept breaking down. As, as part of the commissioning process, they didn't flush the system out and refill it correctly. It would be a ground loop. And when we went back to it and, and took it all to pieces, there was a, a, like a, a, a Tesco's carrier bag being circulated in the pipe and every time it hit the pump it, it blocked and so it, it's where, where's the dividing line but we would always support where we can um, and you know it's always easy with repeat business because you overcome those issues on the first one um, so on that note I've, I've finished unless there's any further direct questions uh, well, you, uh, well, commercially, you get RHI for 20 years, no, 20 years. Um, I know domestic RHI is seven years, but it's the, they're the same boxes made from the same materials. Um, there are other considerations, so we've, we've got some work in, uh, if you're in Jersey or if you're in a coastal area, you need to make sure that the heat pump, um, the box uh, and the, um, the, 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 the impeller have the right sort of coatings on them to deal with the harsher environment. But in theory, you should get years of use out of it. Thank you.